Sarah Rector was born on the 3rd of March 1902 in the city of Muskogee, Oklahoma. Her father was Joseph Rector and her mother was Rose McQueen. She had five siblings and despite coming from a humble background, a stroke of luck would completely change her life. To understand Sarah's story, first we have to look back at her ancestors. Both her maternal grandmother and paternal great-grandfather had been enslaved by Muscogee Creek Indians. In 1866, following the Civil War and the abolishment of slavery, Sarah's ancestors were declared freedmen by the US government and were now citizens of the tribes that had previously enslaved them. In 1887, the federal government introduced the Dawes General Allotment Act in which they stripped even more Native Americans of their land. This was because the government deemed all of the tribal land to be an excess which the tribes did not need. Thus, it was divided and transferred free of charge to white settlers. In 1898, Congress passed the Curtis Act, which amended the Dawes Act. This new legislation divided Oklahoma, which was transitioning from Indian Territory, to state status. This was an obligatory step in order to form the new state of Oklahoma. However, a major difference was that not only white settlers were granted free land from what was former Indian Territory, the unassigned lands were also given to tribes residing in the area. As a descendant from Creek slaves, and later having the status of freedmen, Sarah, as well as two of her siblings, were each entitled to a plot of land. Sarah's was approximately 160 acres. This distribution took place between 1898 until 1906. As a result, nearly 1 million acres of land in eastern Oklahoma was granted as land allotments to children from the Creek Nation. This included around 4,400 black children and thousands of Muscogee Freedmen miners. In total, the Curtis Act stripped tribes of about 90 million acres. Furthermore, upon distributing this excess land, the federal government gave tribal members such as Sarah undesirable land which was considered to be rocky, have infertile soil and thus not suitable for farming. Meanwhile, the more valuable, fruitful pieces of land were reserved for white settlers. However, what the government hadn't predicted was that under the surface of much of the land given to the younger generations was an extremely valuable fossil fuel. The land issued to Sarah Rector was located in Glenpool, about 60 miles from her family home. Growing up, she and her family were quite poor, with her father not being able to afford the annual property tax on his children's allotted land. The $30 that Joseph Rector, Sarah's father, had to pay for his daughter's land was a burden. Due to this, Joseph petitioned to the Muscogee County Court in order to sell the land. However, as Sarah was still a minor, this request was denied. He had to continue paying the tax, which was a heavy strain on the already poor family. In February 1911, Joseph came to an agreement with the Standard Oil Company, leasing Sarah's land to them, finally relieving him of financial strain. Two years later, B.B. Jones, an independent oil driller known as the Millionaire Oil Man, drilled a well on the property, which produced a gusher. Luckily for Sarah, under her land was crude oil. Jones started to operate the property, and within a few months, tens of thousands of barrels of oil were being produced each day. At this point in time, the law in Oklahoma required that all children who were citizens of Indian Territory with significant property and money be assigned so-called well-respected white guardians. This meant that even if their parents were alive, they wouldn't manage their children's wealth. Soon, Rector was receiving a fortune in royalties as a result of the discovery. However, in order to comply with the law, 
There were calls from people around the local area to change Sarah's guardianship. So, a judge appointed a local white resident named TJ Porter to oversee all of Sarah's financial affairs. It should be noted that he wasn't a complete stranger as he was known to the Rector family. News of this discovery soon reached headlines around the nation. Sarah was now meant to be earning thousands of dollars a month at just 11 years old. One account states that in October 1913 alone, she received royalties of $11,500. Apparently, due to her growing fortune, in 1913, the Oklahoma legislature even made an effort to have her declared white so that she could ride in a first-class car on trains. Newspaper reports stated that Sarah's income exceeded that of the president's and that she became known as the richest black girl in America. Yet, despite her massive income, rumors persisted that her living conditions remained the same. Supposedly, she continued to live in a two-room shack with her large family, still impoverished many began to question what was happening to her wealth. In 1914, the African-American newspaper, the Chicago Defender, heard of Sarah's story and the rumors surrounding her poverty. They later published an article which claimed that Sarah, as well as her siblings, were uneducated, had poor living conditions, and that her wealth was being mismanaged. The article caught the attention of several prominent African Americans who became concerned for her living conditions and guardianship. Soon after, an investigation was launched to determine whether or not TJ Porter was properly handling Sarah's wealth. In June, a memo was sent by James C. Waters Jr., who was an agent affiliated with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. William Du Bois received the memo, and in it, Waters detailed that Sarah's estate was in fact being mismanaged. According to him, Sarah received no education, wore cheap dresses, and no shoes. Meanwhile, her guardian earned a large sum of money. Waters went on to add, Is it not possible to have her cared for in a decent manner, and by people of her own race? Instead of by a member of a race, which would deny her and her kind the treatment accorded a good yard dog. It wasn't long until papers across the country challenged the position of Sarah's guardian. Furthermore, other similar cases to Sarah's were being highlighted. Hundreds of native black children had found wealth due to oil discoveries on their land, and just like Sarah, had been appointed a white guardian who frequently mismanaged their estate. Papers across the nation questioned why it wasn't possible for a black guardian to be appointed. Sarah's case became the focal point for this issue. It should be stated that the exact details regarding Sarah and her guardian remain unclear. Shortly after the press brought this issue to light, a correspondence between Du Bois and the Judge Leahy revealed that Sarah, along with her family, had moved into a five-room cottage and that she was attending school in her hometown of Taft, along with all her siblings. The judge also told Du Bois that it was the family who had chosen Porter to be the guardian and that he only received 2% of Sarah's income. Also, white-owned papers stated that Judge Leahy was very strict on guardians if any discrepancies occurred. Even if the situation regarding Sarah's guardianship was greatly exaggerated, the NAACP's investigation brought to light the existing issues of guardianship and the corruption that came with it, meaning less children would be neglected and exploited. Furthermore, Du Bois later established the Children's Department of the NAACP which investigated claims of white guardians who were suspected of depriving black children of their land and wealth. Sarah and her older sister then left school in Taft and received a better education, being enrolled in the Tuskegee Institute's children's school. 
while at the school, a group of criminals had plotted to kidnap Sarah and demand a ransom. Fortunately, various students prevented the abduction. Yet sadly, Sarah's wealth made her a frequent target for violence and exploitation. This may be one of the reasons why she stayed away from the press in later life. In 1915, production on Sarah's allotment was approximately 160,000 barrels of crude oil a month. As Sarah had a one-eighth share, she earned about $18,000 a month, around $460,000 today. At the time, the average household income was just less than $60 a month. To put into perspective just how much money she earned, her daily income was more than the annual salary of most Americans at the time. Due to the immense press coverage of her life and story, Sarah began to receive gifts, requests for loans, and most notably, marriage proposals from much older men, despite the fact that she was still a young teenage girl. Undoubtedly, these men simply wanted to control her fortune. In 1917, the family moved to Kansas City, Missouri, and within a few years, they moved into a beautiful brick mansion known as the Sarah Rector Mansion. By the time Sarah was 18, she was easily a millionaire. She owned various businesses and assets, including stocks, a boarding house, and land. Sarah's mother, known to the family as Mama Rose, was in charge of her daughter's finances until she was 20. Not long after moving to the city, Sarah met a local businessman called Kenneth Campbell. The couple married in 1920. The wedding was very private, with only close relatives having attended. The pair had three sons and later divorced in 1930. By March 1922, Sarah's wealth was estimated to be over $1 million, around $15.5 million in today's money. Rector enjoyed her wealth, living a comfortable life. She enjoyed fine clothing, which meant some designer stores that only typically admitted whites would close and only allow the rectors to shop. Sarah and her mother also enjoyed fancy fast cars such as Cadillacs, Lincolns and Rolls Royce. The two were known to race around the city, leading to Sarah especially getting many speeding tickets. Sarah was known to have a lavish life, throwing grand parties at her home for leading members of the nation's African American community such as jazz celebrities. Despite this, it's thought that she lived a quiet life in Kansas City, with details about her later life being difficult to come by. Sarah lost a lot of money following the Wall Street crash of 1929, particularly as the year before, she and her husband created a car dealership, which went bust. After her divorce, Sarah married William Crawford, a restaurant owner, in 1934. Sarah Rector died on the 22nd of July, 1967, aged 65, from a cerebral hemorrhage. She was then buried in Taft Cemetery, which was her hometown. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Sarah Rector. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, leave me a like and a comment down below. And if you're new, why not subscribe? If you have any recommendations, please send me an email, which is in the description, or a comment down below. Anyway, that's all from me. So I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.